All right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those of you joining us for the first time, and I know we do have a few new groups today, we are all about bringing uh, exploration, conservation, science, and adventure into classrooms around the world. Now, this week in particular, though, is extremely special, and it's been all week long from Monday to now. This is one of our last sessions of the program, but we are celebrating Secret Path Week for the second year with the Gordowney Cheney Wenjack Fund. So this week is all about celebrating and showcasing Indigenous activists, educators, speakers from all around Canada, coast to coast to coast, uh, all towards uh, working to do something to work towards meaningful reconciliation. So one of the ways that we can do that and start is acknowledge that the land that we are on in Canada today as we tune in and as we gather together is the uh, ancestral land and the current owned land uh, of a huge variety of Indigenous peoples uh, for thousands and thousands of years steeped in a lot of amazing tradition. Um, and more importantly than that, I would think, uh, is that it is still home to 1.6 plus million uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis people today. I am broadcasting live in Toronto, which means that I am on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples who have lived on this land for thousands of years. So with that said, I want to dive in with our speaker today. We are joined live by Carol Hermiston. She is a lifelong learner. She uh, is a former registered nurse and certified mental nurse. She recently got her BA in Anishinaabe Studies from Algoma University. And today she's going to share a little bit about her own personal Personal story and that of her grandmother's experiences in residential schools. So this is something that's come up all Secret Path Week. A lot of kids are learning about residential schools in Canada, but maybe you haven't had the chance to hear a firsthand story of what that experience was like. So I'm honored and privileged to be joined by Carol today. I hope you guys are excited as well. For all our classes on YouTube as well, welcome in guys. Let me know where you're joining from as teachers and we'd love to share your questions with Carol at the end. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, Carol, and take us away. Ah, apachigo miigwech. Um, I am so honored to be here uh, to be able to share the story of my my family and uh, my journey um, as an Anishinaabe Kwe um, in this uh, in this world. Um, as um, Jesse has said, I uh, I am still a registered nurse. I retired uh, four years ago, but I still maintain my registration. I went back to school uh, when I was able to regain the status of a First Nation. And I have been basically studying for the last 35 years. Uh, today, I want to share with you a story that I wrote. And it's a story that was told to me by my Nokomis, my grandmother. And I'm going to share that story with you. And then perhaps we can um, talk a little bit more in the end. I'm hoping that uh, a PowerPoint that I had sent forward will be able to view it. If not, uh, Jesse has said he will forward it on to you. We actually just got it, Carol, so I'm just getting it up now. So if you want to begin the story, I'll have it up and then I'll share my screen so that everyone should be able to see that in just a second. Okay, then. Uh, perfect. So um, I'm going to begin my story. So forgive me for not looking into the camera as I read my story. Um, the leaves were just beginning to turn the vibrant colors of the fire, oranges, reds, and yellows. The salmon were beginning to run up the rapids, returning to their place of birth. And it was on a day such as this that the little girl was born on an island surrounded by the river and the rapids. Her people were fishermen and hunters. They were a peaceful tribe. Her mother was the granddaughter of the last hereditary chief of her tribe. Her father fished the rapids and traded with many different people. There already existed one child before her, another girl who had come one year earlier. Their life was simple. They lived in a wooden house on the island. The interior consisted of a fireplace for cooking, heating, and there were two rooms, one for sleeping and one for family gatherings. It was here that her childhood years were lived. Her mother doted on both her and her sister, and countless times the two girls could be seen running through the tall grass towards the riverbank to greet the fishermen upon their return, as well as the special visitors to the island. Some of these visitors included other tribes traveling the lengths of the river and often shared their food by, that was carried by boat with the family on the island. There was moose meat, deer meat, bear meat, uh, beaver, rabbit, and other kinds of game. Fish such as lake trout and whitefish was plentiful as well. They brought baskets of strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, and the father would build a fire while the mother taught the little girl how to make bannock. 
She often included blueberries to the bannock mixture and they would wrap it around a stick and roast it over the open fire. And over it was drizzled sweet and succulent maple syrup. This was one of the little girl's favorite times with her mother. Sharing was a way of life for the little girl and her mother had taught her that to share with others was a way to honor them and their presence. And it was very important. It was a very important teaching that the little girl carried with her the rest of her life. The time that was spent with her grandmother was a very special time and she received many teachings about life and responsibilities. And one of the most important teachings that she always treasured was about the Gichigami, the water. Her grandmother told her how the, this big water was and how it was so crystal clear that in so many places you could see the pebbles on the bottom of the lakes. The shores were often shrouded with thick layers of fog, which many called the dragon's breath. Stories were also shared about the rocks and how ancient they truly were. And grandmother would often tell the little girl that everything has a story. Adizokan, always respect the water. To be able to visit and pray by the water was a great honor. Spring, summers, and fall were very good to the family. And during that time, they were able to fish and hunt and gather berries and other staples for the harsh winter months. And the winter months were spent snowshoeing over the lake and hours by the fire with her mother, grandmother, and other elders and family who shared stories that were only told during the time that the snow covered the earth. The little girl learned very much during these months. In the fifth year of her life, the little girl's mother told her that another child would soon arrive and that they would grow to a family of five. The little girl and her sister waited patiently for the special event to happen. And during the winter months, the time came for the baby's presence and the grandmother arrived to help with the birth. The mother and the daughter worked together to prepare for the birth and any hours the baby arrived and entered the world, another girl. This was the day that everything changed for this little girl. Her grandmother came to them with the wonderful news to say that the baby was beautiful and healthy, but not all the news was good. With a courageous yet saddened heart, the grandmother announced that her mother did not survive the birth. The great spirit has taken your mother home to be with him. The little girl remembers her mother being put onto a boat that looked like a sleigh with sails. The father sailed with the mother over the water to her final resting place, which was on the mainland. And the little girl was not permitted to go, nor was her sister. And after a period of time, both girls were sent to live with the grandmother. They were six and five years old. Their time with her was special and the little girl loved her grandmother so. She would sit by her and watch as she smoked her pipe that was filled with tobacco. And the grandmother would tell her stories of the stars and how they were used to navigate the land and the water. She shared how her father used to use these stars and their patterns and their way home. The little girl often remembered in her older years the smell of the pipe and that tobacco. And her grandmother would make baskets and decorate them with porcupine quills and sell them to the people who would visit the little reserve they lived on. She was able to feed and clothe both the little girls and, her, and the money with the money that was made. The grandmother was not a young woman, but she was quite capable, capable of taking care of the girls. They were fed, they were happy, and they were loved. But the Indian agent at the time did not believe that the grandmother should be taking care of two little girls. She was too old, he thought. Although he could see that they were well cared for with the, with the help of the government and the church, he took those girls from their grandmother that they so dearly loved and sent them 500 miles away to the residential Thunder Bay. They were five and six years old. The little girl and her sister were not allowed to see or speak to each other at the residential school and they were forbidden to speak their Ojibwe language and they were forced to learn the new English language. The little girl would sit by the window on the upper floor looking for her grandmother to come for her but it never happened. One morning just before breakfast the little girl was taken out to the back of the residential school to a graveyard. She was brought to a freshly filled in grave and was told to kneel and say prayers for the soul of her sister who had passed away during the night. She didn't believe that this was her sister and she demanded that they take her to see her sister, Martha. She was told that to be disobedient was a great sin and to kneel and pray for the sister, the soul of her sister who was gone. 
She remained, the little girl remained at this place until her 16th birthday. And on that day, she was given the few things that she possessed and was that she was a good cook, a good cleaner, and she could follow orders well. She was advised to look for work in that field. The little girl, now a young woman, returned home only to find that her grandmother and father had made their journey through the western door. The family living there now did not know her and she didn't know them. To them, she was an outsider and she felt that she did not belong. She was alone, lonely, and would often sit and remember the teachings that she had received from her grandmother. And it was during this time that she met the Anishinaabe man who would become her husband. And together they raised five children, three boys, uh, two boys and three girls. And their family life was hard. They faced many challenges. But as she would often say to me, we did it together. This little girl was my Nokomis, who I loved dearly. She shared this story with me as I grew up, and I don't recall her ever talking about her life in the residential school. Those stories were not to be shared, she would say, with her head down and tears in her eyes. She focused on her family and her life as an Anishinaabe Kwe. She followed her teachings and not only talked the talk, she walked the walk. She was a kind, loving woman who always put others first and taught me to be kind and respectful to everyone. Her door was open to everyone, and although she gave birth to five children, she always, always had more than that in her home. She raised other children with love and compassion, and she never, ever passed judgment on anyone. She loved her culture. She loved her relationship with the Creator, and she was loved by everyone. And when she made her way through the, her journey through the Western Door, my heart was broken. My Nokomis is never, ever far away from my thoughts. And often I remember the stories and the teachings that she shared with me and how they have impacted my life. Her life was full of sorrow and heartache, but in spite of it all, she managed to raise a daughter, my mother, who raised me with the same values and teachings. My Nokomis left for me a legacy that I have not forgotten. And I am forever grateful to her and to the ancestors for all that was provided. And I will never, ever forget the teachings that she shared with me. My granddaughter was the first baby in three generations to be born in our family to receive her Anishinaabe name, her clan, and her colors the first week of life. She dances with me at the powwows, and she has many teachings in the lodge. She picks berries with me, and she returns to the place where her great-great-grandmother was born. She puts her tobacco in the water for all the family members that have gone on through the western door. My granddaughter will carry these teachings with her and she will walk proudly into a future that she knows her ancestors fought so hard for. She is proud to be an Anishinaabe Kwe. She is proud of her family and of her background. She is the future of our people. Since the truth and reconciliation process was completed, I was able to go back into the residential school files that my grandmother and her sister attended. And I found both my grandmother and my sister's names. This was a very emotional and moving experience. And knowing that she spent so many years away from family and all alone is heartbreaking. And I'm overwhelmed with grief when I think of it. My grandmother was a woman who loved deeply and forgave always. She taught me many, many things. And one of the teachings that I remember the most was to always love and always, always forgive. Never ever forget to always remember where you came from and who you are she would say always hold your head up and be proud because as she would say we are Anishinaabe people and this is where we belong our home by the rapids um, that's the end of my story um, and I wanted to share go over some of the the, uh, sto the pictures the first one talks about the uh, the goal of the residential school. And of course, the goal of the residential school was to eliminate everything about who we were, what we were, and where we came from. And so that we would be ashamed of who we were. We would not... ...something that it took away um, our 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 people it took away who we it took away my grandmother it took away all of the times and the teachings i'm sorry i went <laughs> my grandma um 
it took away who we were. So if you go to the other, there's another picture, the next slide. Um, of course, that's Every Child Matters, and that's the um, Orange Shirt Day. And Every Child Matters, um, the thousands and thousands and thousands of children that were taken and sent to residential school, my grandmother um, being one of them at five years old. Um, the next slide. Um, on the left is a uh, picture, of course, of uh, Cheney Wenjak. And this young man was 12 years old when he ran away from the residential school in Kenora because he wanted to be at home where his people were. The picture next to him is a picture of a friend of mine and she's with all of her grandchildren and the two little ones in her lap are the, are the same ages as my grandmother and her sister when they were taken from their grandmother, their Nokomis, and sent away. And the next slide. This is my Nokomis' home. Um, it's a picture that I took in, up in Lake Superior, Batuana Bay. This is the beauty that they took her from. This is what she uh, had to, they took her away from. And the next picture is a picture. Um, for me, it's a very moving picture because, again, it's by where she grew up. And it's a, a picture that was taken of that tree in the moonlight. And I thought of her, that tree all by itself and how it st has stayed over the years. It's been there since I was a little girl and it has, st it has stood firm and it stands firm and it still grows and it's there every year. And that's how I saw my grandmother. She remained strong and she remained a proud Nishnabe Kwe who in spite of what happened to her, taught me how to love and taught me how to forgive. The next slide. And this is her, this is my Nokomis. Um, her name, she was uh, given the name of Fanny, Fanny Lafort. Uh, her father was a, a French man. And um, when she was sent to the residential school, they changed her name because they said Fanny was not a proper name for a girl. And so they renamed her Frances. But when she came home, she returned to her name, Fanny. And that woman was loved by everyone. And when she passed away, everybody that came to pay their respects, I was, I was just so honored and so humbled um, because the impact she had on people's lives. Uh, she was a loving, kind woman. And one of the other teachings she always told me was that, you know, little girl, don't you ever forget that no matter who you speak to, remember this. Somewhere there is somebody waiting for that individual to come home. And there is somebody waiting for them that loves them. So I don't care if they're a beggar on the street or a judge behind a bench. Somebody somewhere loves them. And don't you ever forget that. You are no better than anybody. That was the most humbling teaching that I ever got from her. Uh, the next slide. That is my grandfather. Um, and his name was Henry, Henry Nolan. And next to him is a picture of my Nokomis uh, with my um, cousin, that's her grandson, Brian. And that is the age that he, she was when they took her. That's the age that she was when they took her away from her grandmother and sent her away. The picture on the left, family was so important to my grand, my uh, Nokomis. Um, she always spoke about family and the importance of spending as much time as you could. And of course, in that picture, she's smiling and she's always, was always happy to be with family. The one on the right is my Nokomis and my Mishomis in Batuana Bay. That's where they raised their family and that's where they stayed until um, he passed away. And then, uh, but they lived out there and they ran the lighthouse on the reserve. And there's many, many, many stories. This one on the left is her children. The one on the bottom left is my mother, Anne. And above her is her brother, Richard. And then Frank and Marie. And next to them in the very front and center with a big smile is my Nokomis again. And behind her, all of her cousins, her family. She adored family and she adored being with them. Uh, next slide. And of course, the truth and reconciliation, uh, when the apology came, it was something that was a long time coming. And it's something that as Anishinaabe people, we are still dealing with the hurt and we are still dealing with the, um, the horrific stories and the impact. Um, as I said, my granddaughter was the first 
in three generations to be able to reclaim her heritage and her culture. I didn't grow up in it because my grandmother didn't grow up in it. She remembered stories up until she was five, but she didn't know about about um, the Anishinaabe way of life because she didn't. They didn't teach that to her. She knew about the Catholic religion. She knew about. Um, she could speak French because they taught her that, and she had lost. She lost her language. So, the apology that came is still something that we're dealing with, and it's still something that we are trying to um, learn to live with. But there are so many things that are going on that are ha we're having a difficult time um, accepting that reconciliation is something that the government wants. Um, out in the Nova Scotia, there's there's uh, something terrible going on out there with our fishermen, um, out on the West Coast with the pipelines. So there's still things that we're dealing with on a daily basis, the murdered and missing women, so many, many things. So um, reconciliation is going to take a long time to come, but as my grandmother always said, I believe in people and I believe that generally people are good. So perhaps someday, I don't know if I'll see it before I go, but it's something that's happening. Uh, I think that's it. Is there one more slide? Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, so that's my story. Those are my pictures. Wow. <laughs> Meryl, that was... a. Uh, uh one of the more touching, heartfelt, incredible moments in the history of exploring by the seat of your pants. Um, and so thank you so, so much for sharing that with us today. That was uh, utterly wild. So, okay, we'll take a second to pause and, and process all that and then you as well, because I, I know that was a very, uh, that's a very poignant and personal tale for you. And I really appreciate you sharing it with us. Um, for our classes on YouTube, uh, if you guys want to start sharing questions, I, I'd love to take some. Our live classes, I will come to you in a minute. Um, one thing I'd like to start off with while our classes are, are gathering their thoughts and getting their first question is, you mentioned this idea of the Western door for people passing into the next life or afterlife. Could you explain a little bit more about what that uh, tradition talks about or what it entails that we could highlight it to some of our classrooms? Uh, well, the Western door is the, uh, if you look at the circle, um, the north, the south, the east, and the west. Uh, when we're born, we enter through the eastern door. And when we pass away, we go through the western door. And when we pass through the western door, that's our entry into the um, other side. And that's the western door is the um, how we pass, uh, you know, go into the um, other side to where our ancestors are, to where the mana do, the spirits are, and to where um, the creator is. And that's the other side. That's the world that we go to when we leave this world. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you, Carol. Uh, just a quick follow-up on that. Is there a northern and southern door or are there other? Or No, yeah. um, there are doors, but the eastern door is where we enter the world. So, um, for example, in the sweat lodge, we always have the door facing the east. Um, if you go into any teaching lodge uh, for Ojibwe, I can speak only for Ojibwe, the door faces the east. That's the entrance. Okay. And there will always be, a um, not in a sweat lodge, but there will, if you're in a teaching lodge, we always have a door at the far end, and that represents the northern door. And, um, but the... Um, there's a, there's a whole teaching about the directions, but there's only doors, the eastern door and the western door. And those okay. are the two. Thank you, Carol. That's a beautiful, thank you for that. I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, let's head to Mrs. Ross's class to kick us off. So Mrs. Ross's class is joining us in Tavistock, Ontario. If you guys want to come into the broadcast, ask a question. Oh. You're good to go. Oh, I think there's a <laughs> like a fire alarm or something. Okay, let's go. We'll come back to Mrs. Ross's class. I promise. We'll go to Miss Dupes' class right now. Uh, joining us at John F. Ross uh, Collegiate Institute. So just demute your microphone, guys. Come on up to the front, and we'll be good to go with a question from you guys. So Miss Dupes' class, if you're all set, might be on a delay. There we go. Hi. <laughs> Great questions coming in on YouTube. Ms. Laser, thank you so much for some of your queries. We'll come to you guys in a second, too. Just bothers me. So all our teachers can keep their mics unmuted. It'll actually help when we go in Q&A. There we go. You're good to go. Yes, okay? Yep. Yes? Yep. Okay. So my class has been learning about, um, or we've been reading the book Seven Fallen Feathers, and we've been learning about education for Indigenous youth today. And we just 
have a question about what it was like for Carol to go to school uh, when she has a history of residential school in her family with her grandmother's experience. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I, uh, my years in school, um, as a young woman, I only went as far as grade nine. However, I, I grew up, I grew up in a small, a small area. I didn't grow up in reserve. I grew up in the city. So there is, and there was a lot of racism, um, in our city. So growing up as a native girl in the school system, when I was growing up, um, we did everything that we could to hide the fact that we were native because it wasn't anything that we were proud of. And as I said, the root, of course, the goal of residential school was to do exactly that. So being native was not anything I was very proud of. And although um, everyone knew that I was native, um, there was a um, there was a general consensus about native girls and it wasn't a good one. So um, we sort of did what we could. We kept our eyes down and we didn't speak, hoping that they wouldn't see us, hoping that if they didn't see us, they wouldn't um, bully us and they wouldn't berate us. Because most of us um, Native girls did not come from wealthy families and um, our way of living was so much different than theirs. So um, it wasn't a good experience for me growing up and going to school. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, uh, we're, that's what this is all about, is sharing the stories, good, bad. Um, and so uh, thank you for the question, guys, as to kick us off. And uh, thank you for your answer, Carol. Uh, let's head to Ms. Rajmuli's class. They're joining us uh, live in Toronto, right down the street from me. Uh, Ms. Rajmuli's group, come on in and go for it. All right. So who had a question? Ms. Charlie? They're all getting shy right now. <laughs> I had I had a couple of questions. Um, I was wondering, Carol, so, uh, you mentioned your grandmother returned from a Oh, sorry, my here. Mule, you're away from the camera in a way where I can't actually hear you anymore. There you go. Um, so I was wondering, uh, Carol, you mentioned your grandmother returned uh, from a school that she wasn't accepted. Can you tell us a bit more about that, like what she experienced and why that was? Yeah, so Carol, if you didn't catch that, you mentioned that when your grandmother returned, she wasn't accepted uh, into her community. Can you tell us a little bit more about that experience and what that was like and details? Well, when she came back, of course, she was. they took her when she was five years old. And when she came back, she was 16. So they didn't know who she was. She was a stranger who came back into the village. And at that time, the village had moved from the island, Whitefish Island, out to Batchewana Bay. So when she showed up back in the village, they didn't know who she was, uh, although she said, well, my name is Fanny and I am the daughter of John and Sophie. And my grandmother was was they they looked at her. She was a stranger to them. They didn't know who she was. She could not speak the language. They all knew the language. They all spoke it fluently. So she um, she couldn't speak the language with them. Um, and they did see her as one of them and because she had been gone for so long and she was now um dressed in the um uh you know in the colonialistic way and her life and her actions were all colonialistic they didn't trust her because anishinaabe people um they didn't trust the colonialistic they didn't trust the settlers they didn't trust anyone so she showed up as far as oh Carol, you got cut out for a second. Let I get you back. <laughs> Sometimes when we're broadcasting from afar, the connection doesn't agree with us. Hey, Carol. Uh, have you lost me? I did, but you're back. I can hear you now. Your video is not quite back, but it should pop in in a second. Sorry. That's okay. You were Bye. going along. You were halfway through. We only missed a couple sentences. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep, you're all good. Okay. No, just that that she they didn't trust her uh, because she, to her, she was a, to them. She was a stranger and she was no longer one of them. Um, she she wasn't she they didn't grow up together. She couldn't speak the language. They all spoke the language. They all had a certain way. And if uh, they all have a, had and have a certain way of interacting. So um, 
they didn't trust her. They didn't, they didn't know her. So that's why they didn't accept her. Um, again, thank you for, for sharing all this. And, uh, uh, you know, there's a great question on YouTube that I want to share because it ties into everything you've been talking about. And then we'll go to uh, Miss Rusfit's class in a second. Um, so Miss McAfee joining us at grade 10s in uh, Blue Water District School Board. They want to know if families could say goodbye when children were taken to these residential schools. So you talk about being taken as a small child out to these schools. How did that process go? How did people, who came and took them? Are families able to say goodbye? Was there... What was going on with that? Uh, most of the time, the children were taken when the parents were unaware. Um, the children were taken. Uh, they would be, there's there's stories told about how one of the, the planes, especially up in the northern communities where the planes would come in and the uh, boy, the children would be out playing by the water and they would just be scooped up and taken. Uh, the parents never got a chance to say goodbye. Uh, the parents never got a chance to see them. Many times parents would go to where these children were at these schools and they weren't allowed to see them. They weren't allowed to speak with them. So these children left. Um, and in my grandmother's case, I don't know. She never ever told us if um, if she was allowed to say goodbye. She certainly wasn't allowed to say goodbye to her father or any of her friends because when they came in to get them, they took them and they took them quickly. So most of the time, no, there was no goodbyes. There was no hugs, no kisses. They were scooped up and taken. And that was the, and that's how it happened. Uh, again, over the entirety of Secret Path Week, uh, kids have been asking about residential schools. It's something that's been uh, a huge topic of discussion at a lot of grade levels across Canada. You mentioned Orange Shirt Day, too, and this is something that we've been seeing increasingly uh, rise in, in popularity, so to speak, uh, coast to coast to coast across Canada. But I don't think, certainly I've never heard a story that's as personal as this uh, about this experience, and I, I think it's uh, really fantastic that you're, you're taking the chance to share it with us. So thank you, Carol, and uh, I'm sorry that it uh, has to be uh, the situation at all, and but we really appreciate you telling us uh, this tale. Um, we've got a bunch more questions coming in online. Over 250 kids are watching from across Canada, so welcome into all of you, and thank you for joining us for Secret Path Week and for Carol's story today. That the feedback's been tremendous. I want to go to uh, Meadow Lane Public School now for Miss Huswitz's class. So come on in, guys. Uh, if you have a question for us, go for it. Hello. Students want to say hi. All right. Okay. Back up, guys. Okay, we have a, a question. We have yeah. something against social media. Um, did you ask your grandmother to share? How open was it in your family to share the experiences at residential schools? And when there was sharing, um, at what point in her life were you learning about her life? And do you feel that there was a time where they where she was ready to share her story? My grandmother did not talk about the residential school. As I said, when we would ask, she would say, those are not stories that are to be shared. And she would have tears in her eyes. She did not want to talk about them. The few stories that she shared were the ones where her sister had passed away and they came and got her and that was it. Um, th that she wasn't allowed to speak her language. Her and her sister were not allowed to see each other. And, um, the other story that she talked about the residential school was waiting for her grandmother because uh, the school that she was at in Thunder Bay, there was a long, long road uh, driveway that would lead to the main road. And she would spend any spare time she had watching for her grandmother to come and she never come. As I said, the goal of residential school was um, they couldn't kill the spirit in the adults. They couldn't take the language from the adults because they already spoke it. They couldn't take the culture from the adults because the adults lived it. So what better way to kill a culture and squash it than to take the children? And they took the children and the children, they cut their hair. They were, they were not allowed to speak their language. They were not allowed to practice their culture. They were not allowed to speak to any family members. They were isolated hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles away from their families. And um, when they came out of residential school, there was no connection back to the communities that they came from because they weren't part of that community anymore. So it was like, it was, they were not welcome back in their native communities. Mm -hmm. 
And the non-native communities didn't want them because they saw them as dirty Indians. So when you see Anishinaabe people on the streets, the street people, when you see them on the street, those are people that have, have been struggling all their lives for whatever reason. And those are the, for whatever reasons and for all of the tragedies that happened. And those are the people that my grandmother said, no matter who they are, no matter where they've come from, somebody somewhere loves them. And right now uh, in Toronto, that's where my daughter, and I want to share, a, a, that's a sad part, but a good, a nice happy part is my granddaughter now is in Toronto going and attending Ryerson University. And that's an amazing, amazing quest for us because there is the third generation. Um, her education wasn't stopped. She went to school in Toronto and she graduated and now she's in Toronto living by herself, fighting the COVID like everybody else, but she's studying, studying journalism. Yeah. And, um, but all of us, when we grew up, we, it was never something that was talked about going on to um, a higher education because that's not something that we learned was even available to us. Um, when, if an Anishinaabe person wanted to leave their reserve and, and go to college or university, they had to give up their right to be Anishinaabe. They had to sign a piece of paper and the paper said that they were no longer native because the last thing the government wanted was educated Anishinaabe people going back into the communities. Um, so there were, there's so, so many things that happened uh, in the residential school system. And so uh, I don't know if I've answered your question um, uh, for the school, but um, no, my grandmother didn't talk about it. And if you look at the truth and reconciliation stories, they're tragic stories and they're so difficult to talk about. Um, there's a lot of uh, healing that has to be done uh, in order and, and the healing continues. Um, you know, we, the healing continues with our spiritual people. We are now getting back our culture. As I said, my granddaughter has her name, her clan and her colors. Um, she attends ceremony, but that's not something my grandmother ever learned. That's something that I learned looking for it because I didn't grow up with it either. Uh, that's a beautiful answer, Carol. Thank you. Um, I want to change tack a little bit. We're going to go to Miss Charles's class in Brampton in just a minute. Uh, but I love this question from Carol in Miss Graham's class at the Holy Trinity School. What was your motivation to become a nurse, Carol? Uh, was it your grandmother's influence? Was it something else that drove you to that profession? Becoming a nurse was something that I always wanted to do. Um, um, when my mother uh, and us got our status back, um, I truly didn't believe that I could be anything. I didn't think I was smart enough because that's how I, that's how, what my education and that's what, not my mother, but people had led me to believe that I wasn't smart enough. I couldn't do it. So when I went back to school, it was just to get my grade 12. And while I was there, I met another uh, Anishinaabe uh, woman from up north and she wanted to be a nurse. And I said to her, well, I would love to be a nurse, but I don't think I can do that. I think I can be a hairdresser. And um, she, you know, she really convinced me that it was something I could do. And uh, so becoming a nurse, I wanted to come back to my reserve and I wanted to come back and work with my people. And I wanted to be something for them that um, I never had, my grandmother, my mother never had. And that's just what I did. I graduated from nursing and I came back to my First Nation community and I work as a mental health nurse and I worked as a home and community care nurse and I took care of uh, my people. Fantastic. <laughs> How cool is that for you, Carol? And by the way, it was fascinating to me to hear uh, as a certified mental health nurse, this isn't something that even five years ago was, was really on the minds of a lot of classrooms, a lot of people across Canada. So it's good to know that this is a position that is out there, a position that people can get, something that is, is increasingly being taken seriously across Canada and is a topic for another day in, in mental health in general. But kudos to you for all your work to help your community and, and people across Canada generally. Um, let's go to Miss Charles's class. We're ripping through these guys amazingly. We're at the 40 minute mark almost. So we're gonna take a few more questions from our live classes uh, and we'll start with Miss Charles's group. Come on in guys and if you have a question for us, just demute your microphone and you're good to go. Hello, Miss Charles's class. If you have a question, if you don't, that's okay too, but we will need to get your mic unmuted to take it if you're there. So all our teachers can unmute your microphones. You don't need to have them muted. 
uh, it actually helps a lot. So Ms. Charles' class, I will come back to you guys uh, just because we only got a few more minutes left. So let me know in the chat bar if you have a question. Uh, I know Ms. Rajmuli's class has been typing a bunch. So Ms. Rajmuli's class, come on back in. You have another question for us? Go for it. All right, Charlie, do you want to ask you? Come on up. <laughs> sure. Who, who remembers their question? Okay, Kiana, come on up. Can you see the chat? Maybe I can see the chat. Oh, here we go. Okay, Charlie. Go ahead. Oh, right there. What did you? What do, what do you feel when your grandmother told you part of the story um, of her of the residential school that she went to? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. That's okay, I'll share it with you because it's in the chat bar as well. Charlie wanted to know, what did you feel when your grandmother told you the story of her residential school experience? Like not the details, but as you said, she put those aside, but just the general story that you share with us today. What did you feel when you heard that for the first time? It broke my heart. It broke my heart to think that um, that somebody that I love so much um, went through that. Uh, it broke my heart to know that she grew up uh, as a little girl into a young woman and there was nobody, it broke my heart. I couldn't imagine uh, not having that because I had my mother, I had my aunties, I had my grandmother um, who in spite of everything was a loving, caring, wonderful woman. And um, it broke my heart. I'd still, when I think about it, um, I can't imagine being a five-year-old little girl and being pulled from your grandmother that you so loved and going so far away, um, no one, you know, no wonder Cheney Wenjack and his and those friends, so many children uh, died trying to get back home. I mean, imagine, you know, you children that are here listening today being taken from your families. What would you want? You want to come home. And um, she was too little to know that, but it was heartbreaking. And um, you know, I would look at her, and even today when I look at her, I think about how did you manage? How did you manage 11 years being away? You know, it just, it breaks my heart. Um, your reaction to it is is not dissimilar from that of, of everyone who's been commenting. Again, lots of schools across Canada have been taking part in a session, watching on YouTube, um, and your story certainly touched me, and, and so, um, again, all I can say is thank you so, so much for sharing it with us because I think it's a really, really important tale to tell. And uh, it is beyond tragic uh, an experience to have happened to anyone, uh, much less someone that you cared about so deeply. So, Carol, I, I, I want to say I appreciate it again. Um, I want to wrap up with a couple of questions before we, we end the broadcast today. I know a lot of classes are going to other uh, sessions and periods soon. Um, so I want to take this question from Yvette on YouTube, which is, how do you feel when people talk about residential schools? when whether it's in indigenous community members, whether it's uh, the public, whether it's classrooms, um, what are your thoughts going through your head when people talk about it? What's important for them to, to know or to share amongst each other? Well, when people talk about the residential schools, especially the, um, the ones that live through it, their stories are heartbreaking. My grandmother's story is only one of many, many, many stories. And it's an important uh, legacy and it's an important journey um, to travel. Uh, if you want to learn about the Anishinaabe people in Canada and learn about the atrocities that took place and learn about um, the thousands and thousands and thousands of children across this country that were taken. Uh, and um, they actually made a, uh, the government made a law where it was if they came in to take these children, the parents had no choice. That's why many, many of the parents, um, if you do some in research and if you do some investigation, you'll find that a lot of the parents took the kids and went further into the bush to hide so that they couldn't take their kids. So um, again, you know, um, learn about it. I mean, I've, I've made a point of listening to the stories of a lot of people. Uh, my grandmother's was just one, um, but there are under the truth and reconciliation, it's online. Um, it's pretty, it's, it's extremely traumatic. 
but it's a history that this country has not acknowledged and it's a history that no matter i've been going into the schools and sharing stories about all kinds of things about our culture and it always always amazes me that so little is known about the residential school system and so little is known about what happened to my people uh, so many of the children don't know anything about it. Even the teachers don't know anything about the residential school and the impact it had. Um, I'm second generation. My daughter's third generation. My granddaughter's fourth generation. And the impact is still there. It's still there. Um, it's something that, again, a lot of the, the questions uh, coming in in chats have mentioned is how long this legacy lasts, how much it, it's impactful. And I think that your story is a testament to the fact that that the the scarring of that experience uh, transcends generations and goes for a very long time. And so uh, one of the best things that you can do is classrooms. And, and again, it's heartening to see, again, 250 to 300 plus kids, every one of our sessions of Secret Path Week that are here keen to learn, excited to find out about this, this story and, and see what they can do uh, directly to work towards uh, reconciliation and to do something as classrooms. Um, before we wrap up, Carol, I want to highlight for our classrooms a few resources that classes can use to learn more. So as I mentioned at the top of this broadcast, this is in partnership with the Gord Downey Cheney Wenjack Fund. So downeywenjack.ca, you can learn more about residential schools, indigenous stories uh, across the board and how you guys can take action as a classroom. Uh, Carol just mentioned the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Easy website, trc.ca, some of the findings from the report, um, some of the stories uh, that, again, you can use to follow up after Carol's tale today. Um, and one thing that we like to highlight as we partner with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society is they produce something, a beautiful series of books called the Indigenous Peoples Atlas of Canada. So you can learn about Indigenous peoples coast to coast to coast, past, present and future. So I encourage you to check that out as well. Carol, uh, we, we got the chance to hear your, your story today. Um, some very traumatic and, and personal things as we've discussed. Um, is there a message of hope we can leave with classrooms uh, to end this broadcast, things that you're seeing that are, are positive steps in the right direction for Indigenous uh, relationships and, and reconciliation in Canada? Well, I think um, the message I would like to leave is the message that my grandmother always gave to me, is to love and to forgive. Because, you know, when you forgive somebody, you, you know, you can love them. And the other thing that is important is that there are so many, there's so much negativity out um, in the press today. There's so much negativity about, uh, you know, different things. And people will say, well, that's my enemy. The, I think it's important that we need to understand that their enemies are not our enemies. And that as individuals, I think that, um, I always think about a book I read, uh, and it's the story of Anne Frank, and she went through another horrific, horrific um, story. And one of her, um, something she said was that in spite of all of the um, atrocities and in spite of all of the things that happened, she truly believes that there is love in the world. And I do too. I truly believe that there is love. I think it's there. There, there are some positive notes. Um, we are starting to move forward. Uh, there, are, uh, one of the positive things I've noticed is um, from out in Nova Scotia, there are more and more people supporting the Anishinaabe people. So the understanding is there. So um, there is there is positive and there is good in people. And as my grandmother said, you know, just love each other and learn to forgive, and don't don't walk around angry and hate all the time because even as myself, as a woman uh, who grows growing up on a reserve, every time I leave the reserve and go into town, you know, people will say, well, watch this. You know what? I don't believe that everybody is bad. It is out there, but there's more good than there isn't. I truly believe that. That there, there could be no better message to end up any one of our sessions than that. Carol, uh, thank you for a beautiful session, a beautiful story, and, and a wonderful message to, to wrap us up today. Uh, what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in uh, and demute uh, all our classes. So Ms. Rajmuli, Ms. Dupe, uh, Ms. Hustwit, and Ms. Charles, if you guys want to join me in saying a huge thank you to Carol for sharing her story today, you are all in the broadcast. Go for it. Yes,